All right, there we go. All right, Doug Evans, so great to reconnect with you. It's been a long time. I've been able to kind of follow your what you've been up to for a long time, but it, it's great to reconnect and 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 talk and see each other via Zoom. Um, what's interesting to me right now is where you're at, where you're living nowadays, and, and a little bit about that lifestyle. Yeah, look, I think the lifestyle for me is – you know, I want to be in nature. I want to be at peace, right? And I want to be creative. And so I realized I could do that from anywhere. So I chose to be in the desert and I love hot springs. So it's interesting when you're in the desert, you get to see sunrises, sunsets, follow the, the seasons and the moon. It's, it's a unique experience being in the desert. And I love like the water like the water energy and then the heat. So I moved to the desert and not only, in, and I think you've heard me say this before, not only am I in the desert, I'm in a food desert. And so that just necessity is the greatest form of invention. And that's led me down the next kind of chapter in my life. So you've been there a, a while and, and that kind of, did that prompt the whole infatuation with the with the sprouting? Obviously, you you've known about sprouting, you've partaken, you've eaten, you've consumed um, sprouting for a long time now. But you're you're in it. I mean, you know the the book here that I've been I've been reading and, and highlighting, and uh, I've just got it. I wish I would have finished it by now, but I haven't. Um, but this living in the desert has created this extra infatuation with the uh with the sprouting and the consumption of the sprouts yeah i mean if you think about it sprouts have been around from the beginning of time right because seeds germinate and the germination is the sprouting but for most of history those seeds when germinated were in the ground and they grew into mature fruits and vegetables and they took weeks or months or years and that was you know the way nature worked and all of my life i grew up and lived in urban environments where we had access to grocery stores health food stores farmers markets so the necessity although i knew about sprouting and in the back of my mind i said hey if i'm ever like destitute or homeless i could always sprout I had too much access and convenience to mature fruits and vegetables, period. But then when I moved to the Mojave Desert, to Wonder Valley, there, were, there was no Whole Foods nearby. There were no vegan restaurants. I mean, the nearest vegan restaurant is like an hour and a half away. So I had to think about, okay, what was I gonna do for food? And there was no way I was gonna be in the car an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half each way every day just made no sense. So that's when I thought about sprouting. And the fascinating thing about sprouting for me is that I had known about mung bean and alfalfa sprouts and sunflower sprouts. That was my trifecta. But then when I went online to order more seeds, I saw broccoli seeds and I saw azuki and I saw different color lentils and different types of peas and pea shoots and um, chia and then flax and all these other seeds. And within one month, 50% of what I was consuming were sprouts that I was growing in one cubic foot of my kitchen, like one cubic foot. And, and at that point, like the light bulb went off in my head and I said, I have it. This is a solution, not necessarily the solution, but this is a solution for global hunger. This is a solution for weight loss. This is a solution for um, treating, you know, chronic illnesses, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, cancer, like these are ways that sprouts were so powerful. And I knew very, very little about sprouts before I decided to write the book. And then 
I did a month of work and then I felt compelled because I know when you teach, you learn. So I said, I'm going to learn everything about Sprouts. I'm not going to write the Sprout Bible. I'm just going to write the Sprout book as a conversation opener to share what I learned. I pitched one publisher in New York, St. Martin's Press, part of Macmillan. I showed up with a bunch of Sprouts and the editor fell in love and we decided we were going to write the book. And then the hard work um, happened, Glenn. Like I've done hard work in my life, but having to sit and do research and put down 50,000 words that were going to be read by thousands of people around the world who are going to count on this was a serious responsibility. Yeah. I mean, you, you covered a ton of stuff in this, in this book. I mean, I, I made sure I went through it to know what was in it, but you also, you also had an opportunity to talk to some, some people about sprouting. So there, there's six or seven or maybe eight little mini interviews in there. And how did you come across or identify those those people well i my my goal was to make sprouting mainstream right i felt that sprouts had never had their day and i wanted to be the voice of sprouts and push it out there so one of the first people i reached out to was dr oz right he's got a big platform and turns out he loves sprouts and then you know the top functional medicine doctor right dr mark hyman 11 New York Times bestseller books. Now he's not vegan, he's not raw, he's functional medicine, but he loves sprouts, right? And then I reached out to some vegan docs, Dr. Joel Kahn, Dr. Dean Ornish. They love sprouts, right? They're like tribe, they love sprouts. And then I went to like the other side and I went to the guy who wrote the keto book, Dr. Josh Axe. He loves sprouts. Then I went to like one of the leading uh, wellness websites, Dr. Mercola, like a mainstream guy, and he loves sprouts. So the common thread of all these diverse medical professionals who have access to big audiences, they all like sprouts and they like them because sprouts are honest, like they're honest. And there's a global consensus that vegetables are good for you. And guess what? Sprouts are vegetables. So everything that's good about the whole food, plant-based diet is means is good about sprouts. And then some, because sprouts have these unique qualities, and I don't want to use these words like superfoods, but they have unique qualities that make them hyper-nutritious relative to their mature counterparts. And there's a lot in there about cruciferous vegetables having these anti-cancer properties well it turns out the the number one vegetable um that has the anti-cancer compound called sulforaphane is broccoli and turns out broccoli sprouts have 50 to 100 times the amount of sulforaphane of the mature broccoli and i couldn't figure out why so then i reached out to dr jed fahey at Johns Hopkins University, the guy who literally discovered that broccoli sprouts have the most sulforaphane. And so I interviewed him. It didn't make it into my book, but we had good interviews. I've got good content from him that I'm gonna put out. So it was just my desire to share the most accurate information with as many people as possible. And I knew I wasn't inventing anything. I was just sharing. And so therefore, the more people that I could enroll into this process to add credibility to this mission might make it easier for more people to sprout. You know, in, in the parts of the book that I, I did read, I want to ask you, I want to share what surprised me the most. And then I want to ask you, you know, in your research, you know, what was surprising to you, but when you tied in the, the broccoli sprouts, and, and I know I'm going to butcher the word, but um, how do you say it? The sulf sulf sulforaphane. 
sulforaphane. Or, or the research has tied that into autism as well. And that, that just kind of blew me away. And I've already been in touch with a few mothers that are really trying to help kids get off the spectrum. And um, none of them had really had any engagement or any conversation of, of Sprouts playing a, a role in, in helping kids kind of get more balance. So, so that, that to me was super exciting and blew me away. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. It seems like broccoli sprouts and sulforaphane are the number one most effective treatment, not cure, but treatment for autism. And what happens is there's something about how the sulforaphane creates the heat shock proteins that is like a fever when someone is autistic, when, and this is proven, or there's a hypothesis is when someone is autistic and they have a fever, right? Their, their body's running hot, they have a fever, they show less symptoms of autism. And it seems like the broccoli sprouts and the sulforaphane give the same equivalent of the heat shock protein that people, that the autistic um, people get when they're having a fever without actually having a fever. So it's so interesting. And people have tried to patent, you know, the sulforaphane and the, the other things. And, you know, it's in plants. And, and I think the, the, the answer is in plants, right? So no matter what it is, right? Even like most people who are eating animal protein, where do the animals get their, um, where, where are they eating? They're eating plants. So the idea that you can eat plants and get this incredibly powerful, potent um, micronutrients, phytonutrients, it's, it's so obvious. And that's what I, I wanted to share in the book. Like this is obvious information. I'm not inventing anything. All I'm doing is revealing my unique perspective, which you know, when Denise and I started Organic Avenue in 2002, right? We believed that fresh, ripe, raw, organic fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, seaweeds were healthy. And that if everyone was recommending to eat those, um, that produce, organic produce, we said, well, what if you only ate that produce? Or what if you made it easier for people to eat that produce? And that was the foundation of what we did at Organic Avenue. Yeah, I mean, Organic Avenue was a major player in the creation of, of Catch a Healthy Habit Cafe. I found myself, there was nothing really in Connecticut to cling on to as I began my kind of raw food journey in 2003. So I was jumping on a train every weekend I can get off of work or, or get a little break. And, and I always gravitated towards, um, towards Organic Avenue. And, and, you know, obviously Denise was all, always there. You were there a lot. And it was just so nice to be around people and, and be able to kind of talk that that language and then pure food and wine and then David Jubb. And then there were all a whole bunch of other things in New York city, which held my attention. But it was that one night when Denise said, why are you always coming to New York city to, to be there's, there's nothing in Connecticut. I said, nah, there's nothing really. There's no real community like this. And she said, well, why don't you just open a place? And then the wheel started yeah. turning. That was 2004, 2005. The wheel started turning. And it wasn't until 2008 um, or actually uh, mid-2009 that we got open. And, and, you know, we've been around a little over 10 years. But really, Organic Avenue was the, was the foundational kind of blueprint to, to starting our raw food cafe. So you and Denise were, were huge in that. Well, it, it makes me really feel good that our purpose, because as you know, Organic Avenue is no more, right? So in, in a way, things go through cycles. And when Organic Avenue got composted, it was great to see, you know, some of its seedlings, you know, spin off and grow. And 
like what I'm hearing from you is powerful. And so many people like have said the, the same thing or similar things, which makes us feel like it was worth it. I was, I was on a podcast the other day and I said, basically for 10 years at Organic Avenue, Denise and I subsidized raw organic vegan food to New York because with what we were paying for rent and what we were paying for labor and what we were paying for insurance and what we were paying for produce, like we should have been charging $35 a juice, right? And instead we just worked, you know, never took a salary. Like we just worked and just recycled the money back into the business and then grew because what we, we made the mistake, and I call this a mistake, is that we tried to price our things competitively, and as a result, we undervalued them. And it, it would have been you know, hard to do um, because as it was, it was seemingly expensive, right? The products were expensive, but they were so good and so pure that that's what really led us you know, to, to doing it. And when I think about the normal food business, and I'm sure this is like a catch out the Abbott, we have no fillers, right? Like there's no added sugar. There's no added water. There's no like emulsifiers or citric acid. Like we were using a hundred percent fresh raw fruits and vegetables and other produce. And everything was expensive. There was nothing that was cheap. Like we couldn't get a break on anything. Yeah. No, and, and it's still the same. And it, it bothers me a little bit. And, and I'm, I, I don't get too fired up about it. I don't challenge anybody on it. But when, when somebody's outside the window, they're looking at our menu and they say something like, am I really paying $12 for a, a smoothie? You know, what can you do? Because it's just all organic. It's all, it's it's all really good stuff, and it, and it's it's beneficial to the body. It's just not a beverage. It's just not a. It's just not a meal. It's it's life force. Yeah. Look, I think the I think the idea is that you have to know what you're doing, and it may take a lot of hand holding and a lot of communication, and knowing that it's not for everybody. Right. Right. It's just not for everybody. And, you know, part of the thing is, you know, we would do classes, we would do potlucks, we would have movie nights, we would have speakers, and we would do everything to try to bring people in. I was having a, a conversation with Matthew Kenny, and he said that, you know, he took his first raw food classes at Organic Avenue, right? Like, that's where he would come to every event, every dinner, everything we had, and he went off you know, and, and advanced the culinary side of, of vegan cuisine. Yeah. And so in, in a way we touched a lot of people with that service. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, and we'll get back into sprouts, but you walked me down and I don't know, I don't remember what location was, but you know, we walked down those New York city steps and in, in the basement and you showed me, you told me it was a juicer and I didn't, I didn't, believe it was a juicer we said yeah you climb up this little step step ladder and you and you you, you just pour you put all of it in there and it juices it i just was completely blown away i'm thinking of the juicer like the little thing i have on my countertop and you're showing me probably a i don't know 20 15 20 thousand dollar if not more piece of machinery um it just it, it just was mind boggling to see how it was to see how you did it. Yeah, well, look, we started with these simple Norwalk juice presses that did twelve quarts an hour, and we had one of them, then two of them, then five of them, and then we shifted to commercial grade equipment. And what you saw was a Good Nature X One juice press, and that did fifteen gallons an hour. And then we bought one of those, two of those, and we had five of those. And then, and those did 15 gallons an hour. And then we advanced to their next model that had six plates at once that did 50 gallons an hour, and we bought five of those. And then 
we advanced to something that had 24 plates and did 500 gallons an hour, like this big monster juice press. And then we opened up a 10,000 square foot facility with another 10,000 square foot in storage to hold the bottles and the bags and the, the dry goods and large walk-in refrigerators. And then we said in order to do this right, we need to be operating in a refrigerated environment. So there was such a learning curve and the priority because everything was fresh, everything had a short shelf life, everything was expensive. And then, you know, as you know, Denise was a real visionary around the recipes. So things were complicated in order so that they tasted simple and delicious for people. So we learned a lot while we were scaling our operation, we were opening up retail stores. So we opened up 10 retail stores and the production facility, and we did the internet business and the call center and the retail stores that I, we got to learn a lot. That's all I could say. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. That, that place, I, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll never forget the, the orange insignia that you guys had. And, and I still have the, from your first initial place on, on the second, second level of Ludlow, you had um, just come back from some trip with these silk suits and I bought one yeah. of those silk suits and I still have it. I only wear it in super, super duper special occasions. But man, I'll tell you, it's yeah. the most comfortable piece of clothing I've ever had since I, since I got it from you. And it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, what makes that silk so magical is that is nonviolent silk. It's called Ahimsa silk, where they find the empty cocoons after the silkworm eats its way through the cocoon, turns into a moth and flies away. They would gather the empty cocoons and then it was like cotton. So it was hand picked, hand spun, hand loomed, and then hand stitches. So it was totally custom made. But as opposed to the normal silk process where they boiled the silkworms in the cocoon and pull out a reel of silk thread, you know, this was a nonviolent, we called it a vegan silk. Um, and it, because it, it was not hurting or exploiting the, the, the moth or the silkworm, they got to live their healthy, happy life. So happy silkworms, you know, happy Glenn. Yeah, oh, totally cool, cool stuff. So sprouting, um, you, you've gotten this question a lot all through your, your plant-based days, um, but you can thoroughly answer the where do you get your protein so much easier now from sprouts because it's just like they're all, for the most part, they're all just chunk full of, of, of protein. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that according to, you know, Dr. Will B, who wrote Fiber Fueled, you know, very, very few people are protein deficient. Most people are fiber deficient. So sprouts contain micronutrients, phytonutrients, polyphenols, bioflavonoids, soluble and insoluble fiber. And if you're eating a variety of sprouts, diversity of sprouts, you're collecting the amino acids to form proteins. And then some sprouts like lentils and peas have high concentrations and density of proteins within them. So I think that if you're eating enough calories and you're eating a wide enough variety of plants, protein is not an issue. So talk to us about your, your sprout eating nowadays. Have you locked into do you have some favorites or are you just all over the place? You're just always, always kind of sprouting. How many, how many jars do, are you having um, simultaneously right now in, in the desert where you're at? About six. Okay. That's a good mix. Six for me and me and my, my, my girlfriend and my brother, you know, we, we six, six big jars, which each jar having about six cups of sprouts in them is quite a bit. I believe that if people aren't consuming like a, a, a cup, a handful, a few ounces of broccoli sprouts, 
every day, they're just missing out. Like they're just missing out because they're so inexpensive and they're so easy to do and they're so nutritious that like, why wouldn't you eat them? And, and when, when I was running Organic Avenue, like I really had a belief that everyone should be eating whole food, plant-based diet, mostly raw, right? That was my belief. And I would, you know, be like talking my heart out to people to try to bring them in to that thing. Now, I, I'm not telling people what to eat or what not to eat. I'm inviting them to eat sprouts and to add sprouts to every meal, to every snack, to every smoothie, to juice them, that sprouts are like part of the, the, the thought process and the priority. And, and imagine how people are using salt and they're adding salt and pepper to everything. Imagine if they're just adding sprouts and broccoli sprouts or alfalfa sprouts or mung bean sprouts to everything that they're eating. So besides the broccoli, what other ones do you, do you love either for the nutrition or for the taste? I love sunflower sprouts. I just love them. I love pea shoots and crunchy pea sprouts. They're so easy to eat. I love sprouting chia, right? Like chia and flax for the omega-3s. They're just fun to sprout and easy. And then like from a refreshment thing, um, I love mung bean sprouts. You know, they're just, you know, they look like they're the iceberg lettuce of sprouts. And they're, they're not. Like they've got crazy amounts of vitamin C and protein in them. And mung bean sprouts are one of the sprouts that are the easiest to buy. Um, in the grocery store, supermarket, Asian market, and they're so inexpensive, like $1.50 for 12 ounces. So they're like 12 cents an ounce um, for sprouts, which are incredible. And they're a great source of fiber and nutrients. Yeah. I mean, my, my quick sprouting, uh, one of my original sprouting stories was, was, I think it was back in 2012 or 2013, um, when I had the sprout man come to the cafe and he, and he did a presentation and I got fired up and I bought a whole bunch of bags of sprouts and I bought the jars with the screens and all that stuff. Well, it never really materialized where, where all those sprouts were, were sprouted. So as you got me back into this, in this book, I went back down and in my box with all my seeds in it. There they are 2013. I've got probably 12 little bags of um of sprouting seeds and to be honest with you so far i've only got two left but all of them have produced sprouts we're talking you know seven yeah. years in the little bag and here they are and this is my this is my latest um here where i i really just as i got these big jars i just took five of the bags there's a radish in here there's like a combination of of sandwich sprouts and salad sprouts and and I think there's some lentil sprouts in there, but um, you know when I filled them up, when I when I originally put them in here, they only took up about a third of the jar. Now that they're all like sprouting like crazy, they're uh, they're taking up a bunch of the jar. So I'm very excited. Probably go. I don't know. What do you think? Maybe another two days before I can start. I'd eat them. Yeah. I would just. I would. I would take them out of the jar. Put them into. Uh, a bowl in the refrigerator, start eating them and load it up and start producing some more sprouts, Glenn. All right. All right. Well, I got another jar I'm going to put into motion for sure. Well, let, talk about that. I, I, but I, I, I think it's so, so like exciting to see sprouts growing on your bookshelf. Yeah. Like that to me is that, that any part of your house, your garage, your studio can be a place for you to grow sprouts. And, and for, the, for your listeners, the, the thing about sprouts is they don't need soil. They don't need sunshine. They don't need LED lights or fertilizers. They need a little love, a little water, and a little attention. And they will, like they want to germinate. And, and seeds have a real, as you know, from your 2013 seeds, they have a long shelf life. Seeds yeah. like have a long shelf life. 
Yeah. Well, let's talk about that, the, the important part of, of um, sprouting other than the, the jar and the, and the actual seeds is the water. And you're out there in, in the desert. Now, I read in the book, um, but tell us how, how and where you get your water and how important it is to do what you did in order to, to get somewhat pure, clean water to make these yeah, things it's, out. It's interesting. It's like, I want to be really like clear on this. I have some of the best water on the planet just in deep underground aquifers. And so we, we have wells on our land that provide the water and the, there's a lot of minerals in our water and there's so many minerals we end up having to reverse osmosis them to desalinate and reduce the mineral content of the solids um, but the important thing is the better the water the better right there's no question so if you can have spring water or reverse osmosis distilled water or filtered water but i would say that I've seen success, although it wouldn't be my first choice, I've seen success in people sprouting using just regular old tap water, right? With the fluoride, with the chlorine, and you know, I don't recommend it, but I don't advise against it because I, I'm trying to eliminate excuses for people to sprout. Like, I wanna make it easy for people to sprout, so that's where, I say, do the best you can, right? Just do the best you can and you'll get the best results you can. Yeah, and just just get the process going and like you said, eliminate excuses and just, and just sprout away. So um, tell us, and, and it's in the book and I gotta, I, I gotta promote the book um, as much as possible. Did you, write your, did you write your review on Amazon yet? No, I, I didn't. I, I literally just got the book three days ago. Okay, all right. Good. Well, I'm glad you got it. Let me finish the book and I, I will do that. I, I will definitely, I will definitely do that um, for sure. So people want to get going. They're going to listen to this. They're going to watch this. Um, people want to get going. Where, where are they, where are they getting their sprouts from? Where do you order your sprouts from? Where have you had the most success? I mean, I love the, these two companies. Um, do you know Joe DeSena from Spartan Race? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. I did a podcast with Joe and then um, he connected with True Leaf Market and they make a nice Spartan sprouting kit. Yeah. Has some jars, has some seeds, has my book in it. So they have a nice little package at True Leaf Market, which is really great. And similarly at Sprout Man, like I loved the Sprout Man. Steve Meyerwitz was a great inspiration. And so Sprout Man has been around for 40 years. They sell seeds, they sell my book. Um, and, you know, they're committed, you know, to this sprouting lifestyle. So those are the two places I recommend doing it. Um, there's, depending on where people are in the world, um, Amazon, you know, is always the fallback, right? Always the fallback. But I like some of these other like little niche players. You know what, we, we talked about the jar, sprouting really quick you mentioned flax and chia tell us um how you do that that's done a little bit differently the gelatinous kind of seeds yeah. don't necessarily do the jar yeah i think the easiest way to do gelatinous seeds is to get an unglazed like terracotta like a clay pot or clay um pot liner that you you can get you want um and then you soak the the clay liner, the and then you add the water, add um, some seeds to it. Then you get a spray bottle, and you just constantly mist them, like once, twice, three times a day. And if you can't get the the clay um, terracotta pot, then you can just use unbleached paper towels, right? I mean, these seeds want to sprout, and when you talk about the chia. If, if anyone just Googles chia pet, like that's what it is. It's chia seeds on a piece of clay and it forms like an Afro. Yeah. And so, so that's how they, they do it. And, you know, chia is known to be an incredible food. 
It has medium chain fatty acids, omega-3s. And when you sprout chia, you're also getting fiber. You're also getting chlorophyll. You're getting vitamin C. So you get all these extra bonuses that emerge by taking the initiative to sprout these powerful seeds. Hmm. Tell me, I, you know, I read in, in, in some of the credits and I recognize some of these really cool people. Um, one was Michael Fronte, Jesse, I can't pronounce Jesse's last name. Is it Eisler? Itzler, uh, Jesse Itzler. Yeah, because he's in, he's in the basketball world. So I, I'm still following that game a little bit. I can't get away from it. So, um, and then Drew Mill, who was a big part of um, getting going in this whole raw food thing. Uh, so, so are those guys just friends of yours or are those guys that are also um, doing some sprouting too? You know, it's interesting. Michael was a great inspiration of mine um, in 2004. We met in a yoga class and, you know, he was, you know, like almost 20 years ago, right? Or no, we met in 2002. And, and then in 2004, he invited me to go on tour with him. So like we went on tour, we did yoga, we ate vegan food, we talked. And so he's just an incredible advocate for plant-based and for conscious living. So that was, you know, my chapter, you know, with him, you know, Jumil, I met back in, gosh, I met Jumil in probably 2002. So a really long time ago. And Jumil and, and I have, you know, just stayed in touch. And, you know, now he's the CEO of Mark Hyman's company. And so he's just become a great executive in this world of healing. And he set a standard of kind of communication of what it means to be a, a good citizen. So, you know, these are just good people and that I've met over the years. So as we wind up, tell us what's, what's kind of on the, uh, what's on deck for you. You got this book out and I'm, I'm sure you're still in promotion mode a little bit and everybody's asking you to talk about it. What is, uh, what's Doug got upcoming next? I mean, I, I just, kind of got a feeling that you're all the stuff that you've done already up to this point um just not satisfied you want you want to build on this you want to create another kind of something to to, to chase and write about or or create what's uh, what's happening well look I, I i mean one of the things is i've really opened up a whole new chapter and world um of sprouts to mainstream so you know the book is in its third printing already. Um, Goop featured it. Shape.com featured it. I went on incredible podcasts from Rich Roll and Plant Proof and Spartan Race and the Spartan Up podcast. I even went on Marianne Williamson's podcast to talk about food equality. I went on the Wellness Mama, Katie Wells. So there's a lot. There's a lot to do in getting this message out there, and so. I want to get the book translated um, and I'm running a sprout lab. So we're testing how to sprout using jars and trays and clay and various sprouting mediums and all these situations because I want to make it easier for people to grow sprouts. And I'm learning so much. I mean, I've learned more about sprouts since I wrote the book than before I wrote the book. And so I want to get that information out there. So every day oh, I just, I talk about sprouts like that. That's, that's the goal. And, you know, I'm sure things will come out of that, but right now, you know, what I've learned is to just be present and focus on, you know, whatever needs to be done today to get the message out there. And that was, you know, having this podcast with you. And I want to thank you for being just such a great sport because it is one minute and 30 seconds to midnight in Connecticut and Glenn is interviewing and doing a podcast. So big props to you, Glenn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey, you know, it was funny. My, when I changed the on Facebook that it was going to be nine 30 and I was going to be 1130. My wife sent me a text while she's upstairs and in, in getting ready for bed. You're not doing a podcast at 1130. I said, why not? 
And I said, hey, I got to get my man Doug. He's available. I'm going to take advantage of this window. So I love it. Yeah, man. I love it. it. And I just got to say, you know, thank you for, A, you know, coming back from all that you've done and um, settling in on, on this topic because it's exactly what I, what I needed. I was kind of, I'm in the raw food world, in the vegan world, doing all this kind of fun stuff. And, and to be honest with you, I needed a little little extra something to to focus on, and it's nice because I'm growing corn, I'm growing all my vegetables out there, but um, you know, adding the sprouts is is has been just a, a burst of energy for me. So I'm loving it, and I'm promoting it, and this is going to be on YouTube, it'll be on BitChute, I'll, I'll make it a podcast, and all my friends and 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 followers, I guess you might call it, will will tune in and check this out and want to want to know more. By then, I'll have the book read, and I'll be uh, I'll I'll be a mini you here on the on the East Coast. Well, look, Glenn, it's a pleasure. You're a great you're a great man, and I appreciate all the work that you're doing. And I'm so happy that you and Lisa connected. I remember I knew you guys when you told me you were getting married and opening the store. So so happy that you opened up the cafe and you guys are together. So happy anniversary and send my love. Yeah, well, thanks, Doug. Thanks for taking the time, and I will stay in touch with with you and uh, and just keep an eye on all that you're up to. So, good luck and keep rocking. Absolutely, take care, Glenn. All Bye right, now. Bro. be good.